Very good. Well, now I will be able to introduce this new conference with Dr. Yves Lecomte. You are a biologist. You've been a beekeeper for 50 years, so you have a great experience. You've studied uh, biology and you actually did a PhD thesis on the Vara destructor, and you've been working for the INRAE in Avignon, Avignon since 1990. Uh, and uh, the topic of your uh, speech is these feral bees that resist Varroa's mechanisms and, uh, uh, and communication chemical host parasite. Well, thank you for introducing me, says Dr. Lecomte, and I will try and share my experience. I'll try not to be, I will try not to be too formal. So if you like, I will just tell you my story. Actually, it's true. I've been a beekeeper for 50 years and I was lucky to grow in a farm. My father produced milk in the a farm in the west of France in Tablec, uh, a very uh, a, a, a country or region with a lot of bush that has been preserved to the day. So this was the first luck I had. Then my second luck was that I got my first hive at the age of 12 because I dreamed of it. And for once, I worked well at school and my mom uh, offered me my first hive. And second, third luck I had or I stroke, is that I grew in that bush region. And in the bush, we found a lot of frogs and uh, even baby frogs. And a lot of big trees were planted, secular trees. They were at, at least 100 years or even more. And a lot of uh, chestnut trees and chestnut trees had a lot of uh, holes. Uh, and my father has a 600 bush and on each side, it has secular chestnut trees. So since I was 12 years old, I would observe these bees. I had many 20 to 25 bee colonies were in the farm. So in the chestnut trees, in the tadpole trees, in the chimneys of the houses. So I observed all this and I had a lot of fun. And I had a little apiary, but it didn't exceed 10 colonies. Until 1982, the Varroa arrived to, when the Varroa arrived to France and in the west of France a few years later and it killed all the colonies that I knew, the wild colonies, they all disappeared. And my apiary, I treated my apiary fortunately at the time because I think if I hadn't done so, I, they would have disappeared. And until 1995, and in the meantime, I did my thesis and the fourth great luck strike uh, luck I struck was to get this position in Avignon as a researcher. So in 1990, I left to Avignon and in 1995, when I came went back home to my parents' home, to, my far to the farm, I saw that <clears throat> uh, feral colonies were back in the holes of the trees and uh, in kind of uh, uh, basket uh, hives and I took care of my colonies because I was at 800 kilometers from there in Avignon. And in 1996, I left for a sabbatic year to the US. So I was, was, I was far from my colonies. And I thought, well, actually, their old colonies have been back. So I won't treat them because I don't have much time to keep them, to take care of them. So I'll see what happens. And one year later, when I came back from the US, I saw that I had lost one colony out of all the ones I had at the time. So that made me think, well, maybe there's something that happens here. So for three years, I just followed feral colonies. I followed these colonies that I don't treat. And I saw 
actually they weren't die. They hadn't lied. They didn't want to die. And I contacted beekeepers, especially an association called NRCA, and I told them about it. And they said, "Well, not you're not just." You're not necessarily the only one. So why don't you launch a program on that topic? So there you are. I had these bees that seemed to be resistant in the west of France. And same thing in Avignon, where I found out that in the countryside around Avignon, I, there are feral uh, bee swarms and that don't seem to want to die. So. By 1998, I started looking at this in, to, in depth, and I started analyzing the survival of such colonies. For this, I wanted to validate this phenomena, phenomenon. And if uh, I did observe and validate such a phenomenon, I wanted to know why they survived. So I started researching um, or investigate beekeepers. So I uh, sent an ad in uh, beekeepers, uh, newspapers and magazines. And I said, don't you have around you, don't you know about uh, abandoned uh, bee colonies that haven't been treated for at least two or even three years? And I thought that it wouldn't work. And in the end, it worked really well. Because so I also contacted the veterinarian services because they usually know a lot of you know what happens uh, around there. So usually it was grandfathers who had died and the apiary had been abandoned for years. So we got 70 colonies throughout France, um, colonies at the north of the Loire River. We collected them and we concentrated them in the Sartre or the Orne, so that's uh, two western regions in France, and the colonies in the south of France, we all brought them back to Avignon to follow them up. What did we do? We marked, we paint marked the queen to know, you know, what happened with swarming, and we tried and visit twice a day, uh, a month, to see if there was any other disease and that's all and we just left them there and we looked at what we were interested in which was the survival their survival and also uh, <clears throat> we just you know, left them alone and these 70 colonies survived in average seven and a half years with, and the maximum was, here's our favorite, 222. We collected it in the south of Paris and it lived 15 years. Of course, it swamped, but it's still the same colony that remained for 15 years. So it was, so you see with these colonies, when they're not treated, they can, they, we, you know, we, we saw that they could live more than you know, two or three years. So we wanted to know about mechanisms. So we uh, protected uh, the colonies uh, with uh, grills and uh, we placed them in black. The ones who died, we placed in black and the other ones. And you see that the colonies that are empty, are uh, the, the colonies that survive are greater than the ones who die from varroas. And we also looked at uh, phoretic mites on adult bees and varroas have a lot more phoretic mites on adult bees than the ones uh, that survive in orange. And as we checked on them twice a month, we didn't have any specific problem We also looked at mortality in the year, and we saw that it varied between 9.7 and 16.8. Given what we had lived in the previous years, it's quite acceptable 
especially for colonies that are not non-vera treated. We looked at swarming and you see when you don't take care of them as the witness colonies, we didn't stop them from uh, swarming. You see that they swarm, but they don't swarm more in average than regular colonies. We looked at honey production and they produce less honey with regards to the colonies that are non-treated. And the professional beekeepers weren't very happy with this result, but it wasn't the aim of our research. So we had to confirm, we could confirm the survival of these colonies. These colonies in Western France and Avignon have been um, maintained by us since 2007. So we, every two years, we pick a queen and we, uh, and we leave them alone and we look at their survival. And the first year, uh, there's 100% of drop. Second year, same thing. So we fertilize them the first year and then we leave them alone and then 30% survive at the third year and they can last six, seven years. And there's one I have for, that I've had for 12 years and it lives perfectly well. And then we wondered why they survived Vera. It may be due to bees who resist Vera's. It may be the Vera that is less virulent for uh, bees. It may also be a co-evolution between the host and the parasite. It may also be a virus question because the vera induces the multiplication of viruses among bees, but maybe these bees are more virus resistant. And it could also be uh, th th that we left them alone. So we didn't feed them. We didn't uh, uh, transport them. We didn't. We tried to be less as least intrusive as possible with these colonies. So maybe the fact of leaving them alone also played a role. Now we looked at the resistance of uh, these bees to varroas, and what we knew already, we knew several uh, resistance and tolerance features that uh, brought to regulate vera populations. And among these, uh, we uh, kept uh, the grooming behavior. The VH VHS, so acknowledge recognizing parasited cells uh, and they destroy these parasited cells. And the, the swarming, I've already mentioned it. And also, the, and the colonies that swarm doesn't explain everything, but it uh, it reduces the population of varroas. And we looked at the re reduction of fertility of varroa in the cell. So we looked at all that. And here I start with the uh, capping duration in cells. We didn't find any difference. This is the ones that survive and controls uh, control bees are a bit inferior to ours so that doesn't explain much now we looked at the grooming uh, behavior we did a lot of uh, uh, com uh, behavioral tests with um, resistant uh, colony bees with the resistant bee colonies and we saw that the resistant bees were able to develop their behavior and they had a capacity to recognize varas in greater capacity in, in a greater way than the ones the bees that were sensitive to varas so that's why with my team we we worked on pheromones among bees and we decided okay let's see what happens with recognition how could a bee recognize a varroa. Because maybe they resist because they can smell them. So we did several experiments to try and know what molecule varroas uh, spread. 
and we identified a certain number of vo molecules with two different uh, methods and we uh, spread these molecules on the bees. For instance, you see a very simple experiment, place bees in a, a growing, uh, ready, bees have just, who were just born and you leave them among them with a filter and they, you leave, let them get used to the cell where they are and then you take the two marked bees and on the filter paper you place a component that was identified on the varroa and in the witness bee you don't place any components so you place the bees again back and you see how aggressive they are and there we found interesting things with the olea detail you see that aggressive the aggressive behavior of bees who are resistant in orange was much greater than the ones of bees sensitive to varroa in blue. So we continued in the, this way. And we also did electrophysiology of antennas at the time. So we thought maybe there's a greater sensitivity among the in of of the antennas of the resistant bees than on the antennas of the non-resistant of the sensitive bees of the non-resistant bees. And yes, we found that resistant bees antennas are more sensitive to smells than non-resistant bees antennas. Based on these results, at the time in 2006, we published the complete, the full genoma of the bee. This way we could access tools that enabled us to quantify the gene expression. And that is very important because we asked ourselves whether our resistant bees overexpressed or underexpressed some genes to try and go more in depth into these mechanisms. What did we find out? We found out that the bees attacked by varroa under express the how do you say in french the under express i mean they express less genes of the immunitary system so they also express less the genes uh, linked to the mechanical development and and the organic development and the underexpressed genes uh, concerning uh, the brain development. So this is exactly what we find in our hives with these bees without wings that are un unable to do anything. And we, when, when we look at the difference between the resistant bee colonies and the sensitive bee colonies, what was very interesting is that we saw that the resistant bees overexpress genes linked to the sensitivity to stimuli, generally speaking, and they also overexpress genes uh, that, uh, that deal with olfactions. So this le led us to think that such olfaction phenomena are very important uh, for resistance mechanisms. Then we collaborated with the uh, in the Mark Fries laboratory in Sweden, they developed resistant colonies on the Gotland Island. And we tried and know what was the reproduction of Vera in the Avignon colony, colonies or in Sweden's colonies. Yes, Avignon is in black and Sweden is in gray. And what did we see? What did we see? Well, we saw that the colonies that survive naturally, in that case, the roas are less reprodu reproduced here, not even 05, 0.5, whereas uh, colonies that are more sensitive, there's a, a 0.7 uh, varroa uh, development. So we wondered whether it didn't have to do with the V8 
VSH character. What's the VSH character? When you have a nympha of B parasited by the Vara, they are workers who are able to detect the parasited cell and they can decap the cell and get rid of everything, meaning they eat the nympha and this way, Vara doesn't reproduce. It prevents the Vara from reproducing. We've also worked on recapping. Some bees decap and this way the Varroa can leave and then they recap. So these are two complementary phenomena. So the decapping and recapping, that would be the kind of the first phenomenon. And then there's the uh, more uh, sophisticated phenomenon or, or the, the third phenomenon, which is to clean everything else. And we, so we saw that uh, our bees were varroa hygienic, had a varroa hygienic behavior. That was the second observation. And at the time we knew John Harbo and Jeffrey Harris at the USDA from Baton Rouge in Louisiana, in the US, and they worked on VSH. So the, so the Vara sensitive hygienic trait, and they had VSH colon, colonies, and we worked with them to know whether some genes weren't overexpressed or underexpressed with, on their VSH bees. And what did we show? Actually, in their VSH bees, some genes are have to do with olfaction, especially odoron binding proteins that are overexpressed in their bees. And again, it goes in the sense of a better olfaction. In the meantime, Fanny Mondé showed. Actually, she carried out the same study, but with John Harbo, we had worked on bee brains, but Fanny worked on antenna, on bee antenna. So she took sensitive bees antennas versus VSH uh, bee antennas. And same thing in the antenna. They are in the VSH, uh, B antennas, uh, olfaction is overexpressed. Now, as an anecdote, we've developed another experiment that you may find funny. In the same apiary, we placed uh, surviving bees and colonies that were sensitive. And we looked at the type of propolis they would collect. And we did it in collaboration with Professor Bankova, Bankova and Propova, who are specialists in propolis uh, among bees. What did we discover? Well, res varroa resistant bees, I mean, bees that survive raw, look, collect propolis with more caffeate than sensitive bees. And caffeate or caffeic acid has a effect to fight infections, especially pathogens of the microorganism type in the colony. So that we found really curious because it's a concept developed now. The concept is that colonies that survive have, let's say, a better capacity to go to the pharmacy than others. Then we looked at the virus. This was in the 2000. We looked at all these viruses, but uh, the, the, they were less precise than currently. And we saw that in our colony, there were less ABPV in our resistant colonies and less uh, CBPV than a, in a sensitive colony. So what did we do? We injected the virus 
of sensitive colonies or resistant colonies. We injected such viruses and we didn't see any difference concerning the survival of such colonies. So apparently we didn't show that these colonies were more resistant to virus. But in 2017, we did another research with the same lines, but the same colonies, but with more modern tools. And we didn't see any significant difference between resistant uh, stems and sensitive stems. On the other hand, what we saw, this is uh, one, a member of our laboratory that showed this, the virus of uh, deformed wings, for instance, recombines with other viruses, especially the one we call VDV. And here you see a virus that has recombined once. Here you see two recombination or remerging of the two viruses. And here you see a third recombinant, tri tri triple recombinant. And then this and we found this triple recombinant in the colonies, in the surviving colonies. And we didn't find this triple recombinant in the sensitive colonies. So is this triple recombinant less pathogenous, pathogenous for our bees? We don't know. We still have to uh, prove it. Now, another hypothesis is that the uh, virulence of the varroa mites are less is less than in the other colony in, in the non in the sensitive colonies. For this, we made markers that we call microsatellites, and we looked at the mitochondrial uh, DNA and we want to see the genetic diversity of our varroa because at the time there were two types of varroa on the planet either. Haplotype, the Korean hap, haplotype, which is a subspecies. At least it's genetically well differentiated. And in France, we had the Korean haplotype, and then there's the Japanese haplotype or haplotype, but we had the Korean one in France. So we saw that Varroa's in France and were of clonal, had a clonal structure, which is not surprising because. It's probably with one or several varroas that it went from the Apicerana uh, bee to the Mellifera bee in the east of Russia, and it then traveled um, towards the west of Europe. So it wasn't that surprising. The thing is, uh, some 10 years later, developed more precise methods with microsatellites. And what did we show? Well, actually in the survival colonies, there are populations of varroas that we can genetically differentiate from the populations in sensitive colonies. So maybe there's actually an evolution of varroas towards a lesser virulence. We haven't been able to prove it yet, but we've proven the first stage. There's genetic difference between varroa populations. Now in France, <clears throat> what are the lessons learned? Well, there's different causes to explain the survival <clears throat> of our bees. Social or individual immunity, olfaction, propolis, viruses, don't know yet, the reproduction, the vra reproduction and or VSH, and also swarming. So probably it is not one single mechanism. Maybe the VSH is quite relevant, but there's also other mechanisms and probably a whole set of such mechanisms make bees resistant, varroa resistant, and enable them to survive varroa. I, we think that one of the most interesting character is the VH, VHS. So we work on this currently with Fanny Mondet, especially, who is in our team, and she uh, studies this especially. And so VHS 
is something that was characterized by uh, Baton, the Baton Rouge researchers, but to characterize a colony, which is VSH, VHS, it requires a great deal of time. We can do it because sometimes we're lucky to have this time, but uh, beekeepers don't have the time to do it. So the idea was to try and find methods to characterize the phenotype of our colonies to know whether they were VSH or not. And for this, with Fanny, we studied molecules produced by such infested uh, cells that induced the decapping behavior of uh, uh, bees. And what did we find? We found that the infested cells produced more uh, pheromonal stera, which we know, they are cousin pheromona, pheromone, sorry, and they, uh, they emit VPS, what we call VPS is they're special, they're specific to parasited cells. So we each took these VPS and we injected them with a small syringe uh, behind the capping and we looked at what happens. What happens? Well, when you inject such molecule, the workers decap and they even get rid of what's inside. They get rid of, sometimes of the nympha. So what we want is to offer, to propose beekeepers a method based on such molecules. We couldn't, we could like spray one uh, a capped um, brood and we would wait to come and see a few years, a few hours later. And uh, if it's there and then the colony is VHS. Several INRA teams have developed this. We, tr we try to see whether there's molecular, specific molecular markers of VHS. What do we do for that? VSH, sorry. And we look at uh, their behavior and we see whether there's a specific marker of such bees. And the idea is to say that once we've identified such markers, we may ask uh, beekeepers to give us, say, 15 or 30 workers, and then we'll look whether their the colonies have these markers. And this way, they will be able to select their bees based on colonies that do have these markers, or why not, that have the capacity to decap cells when we spray molecules uh, impl implied in the v VSH or that, uh, you know, that work with the VSH. So this is con con concerning the chemical communication. So in France, we did all this work. We started for a long, a long time ago, but we're not the only ones. John Kefius also develops a Vera resisting bee uh, species um, and he even started before us and he's quite successful and in Sweden there was another research it was a bit different for them in the island of Gotland uh, in Sweden they brought 130 uh, beehives and they left them with the varas and uh, well I exaggerate you know they didn't quite abandon them but more or less and then the you know, they used what we call the Bond, James Bond method, live or die. So you leave the bees and either they live, either they die. So I was in Sweden and it was also Kefu's uh, method. And in Sweden, they developed such method. They lost a lot of colonies in the first years, but then among the ones left, they, they found out that they were resistant. There's also colonies in Norway. In the US, there's our, well, not our, their Africanized bee, which has spread almost everywhere 
throughout the American continent and they naturally resist with no treatment whatsoever. They resist Varaz. Then there's a Tom, there's Tom Silly's Breeze. It's not a great population, but he did an in-depth work as uh, you were explained this morning. And in Puerto Rico, there's the uh, professor, uh, Tugrul Girai's professor, who's a friend. He has gentle Africanized bees who resist varroa. So he was quite happy, he invited me to visit and we because we collaborate on another program. And so you see with these Africanized bees, they don't bite and they are varroa resistant. Then there's uh, Barbara Loke who made uh, who wrote an article showing that there was a whole lot of spots in the world where there's bees who resist varroas, especially in South Africa, with the two subspecies that uh, he has there. I mean, she's Capensis. Uh, in Kenya, it resists. In Tunisia, some resist. And Russia, Primorsky, uh, resists. So in, fa in fact, it is something that seems to be generalized, fortunately. So are they the same mechanisms carried out in the different populations? Maybe there's a background, but we've already showed that uh, it's not necessary. They don't always follow the same mechanisms. Then there's a pattern we could use to know more. We could have a modeling approach, or uh, you know, to find a pattern to of uh, for this to see how the these colonies survive. Now we always talk about bees who survive raw. But these so-called natural bees, the ones we call, talk about today, don't just resist vera. They resist everything. They resist locks and they resist all stresses. So we need to understand that hmm, they don't just fight vera. Now, are these colonies interesting for uh, beekeepers in France? I think in France, there's a lot of beekeepers who are interested by this type of colonies because these are colonies that are often local. And beekeepers, whether they make 10 or 20 kilos of honey, they just want to have their bees and that's all and they're happy. So I think there's a niche here for such resistant bees. Now, we need to know also that such bees were genotyped and they are not pure. They are hybrids, but 80%, they have 80% of genes that are mellifera mellifera, black bee. And my position with regards to this is the following. The most relevant is not necessarily to go and use pure bees. The aim is to use, the idea is to use uh, bees that are well adapted locally because with global warming, uh, as was mentioned this morning, if it arrives very fast, maybe a pure black or Caucasica bees that were used by our great grandfathers, they were great at the time, but as everything is upside down, we may be happy as in France, to have a, a greater uh, genetic wealth so that we, the, we may combine genes in order to get local bees that will be mainly, I think, mellifera, mellifera, but who will have genes from other species that will enable them to uh, fight varas and other parasites. And third, thirdly, if such bees aren't interesting for professional beekeepers, but it's interesting, very interesting for biodiversity, and especially where there's not much beekeeping because beekeepers don't want to go there. If colonies come naturally, that would be very interesting so that they can uh, pollinize.
so these are the lessons we can learn. And actually, yes, we think that mechanisms are similar among the different lines of surviving bees, but not necessary. Now, what we've done with researchers, with European researchers, is that we tried and exchanged such resistant colonies between countries to see whether these colonies continued resisting. And in fact, no. We found out that when we take these colonies out of their biotop, they are not resistant. So we see that these are bees, these are colonies that are well adapted to their habitat. And since uh, we work on, we've been working on varroa on bees, I've seen a lot of publishings. So I don't know if we should congratulate scientists because it would be a bit pretentious. They only do their work. But what we can do is congratulate Apis serrana that has evolved with varroa for hundreds of years or even millions of years. And they find a, a balanced relationship with parasite. And we should congratulate our Malifera bees because we see that this resistance phenomenon, the survival phenomenon is real and it appears everywhere worldwide and we can really work on it. So yes, they can do it. And for me and for us, I think it's uh, it brings hope for the future of these bees that are really very interesting. And I think for the future of beekeeping. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yves Lecomte for such a great uh, presentation, very rich, very full of learnings, thanks to these many experiences that you were able to carry out. <clears throat> and for us, this day goes wonderfully, thanks to all of you. Now, I'd like to take about 20 minutes uh, as a break, in fact, we could follow right away, but if people wanted to connect to this conference at four, it wouldn't be correct. So let's have a small break, a 20 minute break. And thank you all. And we'll be back at three o'clock. Uh, I've tried to follow 40 minutes on the dot. Yes, like the other one. No, it was actually the great thing to do so that you would respect 40 minutes. Great, wonderful uh, timing. Perfect, thank you very much. Goodbye.